I invite you to take your Bibles in hand and turn to Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 1 to 6. And I'll invite my wife to come up and share, read God's word this morning. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them and will bring them back to their pasture where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them, and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteousness. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for these words that that you've given to us more than 2,000 years ago. It spoke to a time of when you would come. So we thank you for these words that we have to study this morning. We ask you, Lord God, to open our ears to hear from you, open our eyes to see you, and give us the courage to put into practice what you teach us this morning. For these things we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, this seems to be an interesting passage, doesn't it? Kind of an odd passage for Christmas, don't you think? When it talks about judgment and some doom and some gloom, it kind of seems odd, doesn't it? But yet, this passage is actually a prophecy of someone who's to come, a shepherd who's going to come to lead a people of Israel, to lead them back to the place that God wanted them in relationship to him. My wife loves to do some study on her family tree. And because of that, I try to do some of my own. Actually, my wife has done most research for my family tree study, which was hard to find some information, but my my wife loves to find that information about past families and how families have come together through family tree. In this passage, it actually speaks of a family tree too. In one verse, it talks about David, how there's going to be a branch that comes from David who's going to come and do an amazing thing, not just for the people of Israel, even though that's the context of our passage this morning, is more than just for the nation of Israel. After all, remember, God gave a promise to Abraham and said to Abraham, I'm going to make you into a great nation by which all nations would be blessed. And today we know that how all nations have been blessed by the nation of Israel. So this morning, we're actually looking at a little bit of a family tree this morning. One of the line of David who would usher in the greatest king, the king of all kings. I've entitled this sermon this morning, The Branch of the King of Kings. We know that there's been many kings throughout history, but there's one king who stands above all kings because of the great royalty he has. Because he is God. But our passage this morning begins, first of all, with a warning. Let's read these words again together. Verse 1 and 2 says, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people, you have scattered my flock and have driven them away. And you have attended to them. You have not attended to them. Behold, I'll attend to you for evil deeds, declares the Lord. What these words mean here is that there was a time that God placed kings over the nation of Israel. You might remember Israel first started off as a nation without a king because God was their king. 
But at a certain point in their history, they said, you know, we want to be like other nations. We, we want to have a king over us. Now, God warned Israel that that probably wasn't the best idea for them. But yet, they still wanted a king. They wanted to be like everyone else. We often do that sometimes do in our life, don't we? There's times we're like, we want to be like everyone else. But that's not what God calls us to be like. God granted the request and placed a king over them, but the kings weren't always the greatest to treat the nation of Israel. Some were actually downright cowardly. Some did some evil deeds against the nation of Israel. And there are some who kind of walked by the wayside and left them to their own devices. At the writing of this passage, the king of Israel was, was King Zedekiah. And it wasn't a great king for the nation of Israel either. He was not a man who feared God. And because of that, he ruled the nation of Israel in a way that was not a blessing to the nation and did not point them towards God. That's why God tells the shepherds of Israel, the shepherds being the kings of Israel, there's coming a day where I'm going to judge you because you did not fulfill your role as shepherd of my nation to care for them the way he intended them to be cared for. So that's why there's this woe, a coming judgment for those shepherds. In verse 3, it talks about how God will gather the remnant of his flock, the people of his nation. Verse 3 again says this, Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I've driven them, and I'll bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. Again, in the time of this passage, Israel was actually in exile. There were some who were still in the nation of Israel, but there's many who were scattered throughout the world at the time. And God is saying here, I'm going to bring them all back together. There's a remnant of Israel, we're going to bring them back together. The term remnant here means what is left or the remainder in, in regards to descendants. So God's saying, what is left over of the nation of Israel, I'm going to bring them all back together. I love the term remnant. It's a term that's used throughout Scripture. In the Old Testament, it refers to people of Israel who are in exile. He's going to bring them back, a remnant of Israel. In the New Testament, the term is used of those God's going to bring back to his fold, his whole body of the church including the nation of Israel at some point. There's prophecies that someday God's going to bring the nation of Israel back into this whole fold to be part of his body, the church. Now we know that there are some Jews who are Christians already. They're called Messianic Jews because, because they are Christians. They still practice Judaism, but it's still an extension of Christianity. We don't have to follow the old practices of the Old Testament. They still do them in remembrance of their heritage, but they recognize that each of those festivals Festivals they practice points them back to Jesus. I look forward to that day when we'll see more people, the remnant that God has planned to come back to be a part of his church. Then verse 4, it talks about how God will set shepherds over them who will care for them. The kind of shepherds that God intended in the first place. Again, verse 4, I will set shepherds over them who will care for them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall any be missing, declares the Lord. God's going to set up shepherds who are going to lead people back to God, to restore relationship between God and his people. This lands to the very next paragraph. It gets to the heart of, of what God is teaching us here this morning. That shepherd who's going to be appointed is Yahweh. That is God, who would become Jesus. So not become, he is Jesus, who would come and take place on the cross for our sins. That's the whole point of this morning. One single point a king is raised up. Verse 5 gives us those key words. 
Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll rise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and and shall execute justice and righteous in the land. There's a promise that God gave David. A covenant he made with David and said, there'll always be someone sitting on your throne, someone from your line. But as we know, that there is a time in history where some of the kings fall short. And after Zedekiah, there was actually no king on the throne of David. But that doesn't mean that there wasn't a king still. That king is Jesus. He came in the form of a babe 2,000 years ago. The very reason why we celebrate this season. Jesus came in the form of a babe, the king of all kings. So these words in verse 5, when it says here, Behold, that is his coming, declares the Lord, when I will rise up for David a righteous branch. That is the righteous branch. That is Jesus Christ, who has come to be king of kings and lord of lords. It makes sense because it says he'll deal wisely. He'll deal wisely with all of, of, all of mankind. That's why, again, he came and died on the cross for our sins. He'll execute justice. I don't want to call sure we love the term justice, don't we? We want justice upon those who do wrong against us. We don't necessarily want justice for ourselves. But whenever someone does wrong to us, we want justice for ourselves, don't we? But God is the righteous judge of all. There's some people who will say sometimes in our world that, well, God isn't just because look at all the evil that happens in this world. Look at all the bad things that happen to kids and children. Look what happens to people who are good. Evil that happens to them. My response to that is actually there's no good person. Maybe to your own standard someone is good, but our standard doesn't really matter. It's God's standard to who a good person is. And all of us fall short of it. God's word tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That means that we're not good people. So we don't like to hear that, do we? We don't like to hear that if God truly is a just judge, that there's going to be judgment for us. But he is a just judge. All the sin of this world has been penalized. It's been penalized by Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. So all we need to do is accept that gift of salvation then and turn to them, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I recognize I'm a sinner. And I surrender my life to you. When we do that, Jesus forgives our sins. See, it shows that he is a just God. Our sins had to be paid for. There's a penalty for it. But still, the penalty has been paid. You don't have to pay for the penalty for your sin anymore. You will if you don't turn to him. You'll pay for it for eternity in hell. But you don't have to face that. Jesus paid the price for you. So it shows that God is a just God. But also that he is a righteous God to come and do that in our place. Verse 6 says, says this, In his days Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Jesus would come to save all of us. In this passage, the context is that he'll save Judah and Israel, but he'll save them, but he also saves us as well. It's very interesting here. The name that's mentioned here in verse 6. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Why is that interesting? Because of what the name Zedekiah means. The name of Zedekiah actually means Yahweh is my righteousness. Pretty interesting, right? And yet Zedekiah wasn't an example of that at all. So Jesus had to come. So we don't have to go look at Zedekiah anymore, that God is his righteousness. 
but that Yahweh is our righteousness. He is our righteousness for every single one of us. So Jesus came, the Messiah. He came to fulfill the expectations of the David, Davidic king. The expectation that God had for every king of Israel. Whether they fulfilled that or not is another matter. But Jesus came as king to fulfill what the Father intended the king to fulfill for Israel. What God intends for the shepherd to fulfill for all of mankind. We have this picture in the season of a wonderful king who came. The story of the line of David who came to pay the price for us. This Christmas season, we remember what Christ has done for us, but we remember that he came. I just want to share that story with you a moment now to remember as we have this Christmas season of our birth of our Lord and Savior. The story goes like this. There was a young woman by the name of Mary who was visited by an angel one day and told her how blessed she is and how blessed the nations will be because of her and how she would be remembered through history because of how God was about to use her. The scriptures tell us about how she was nervous and scared. And the angel told her, you don't need to be afraid. For what is conceived in you is of the Holy Spirit. Something wonderful is about to take place. Shortly after that, there is a man named Joseph. And we know Joseph that he was betrothed to Mary and Mary was betrothed to him. They're in essence married, but they weren't living together yet. But word had gone to Joseph that Mary was expecting. Scriptures tell us that he had planned in his heart and his mind then to divorce her quietly. Because of the law of the time, she would be stoned for being pregnant before being married. He didn't want harm to happen to her. So he decided he would divorce her quietly. But one night an angel visited him. The same angel, Gabriel, who visited Mary and told Joseph, Joseph, you don't need to worry because what is conceived in Mary is of the Holy Spirit. Take your wife because what is con conceived in her is one who would come and save your people from their sins. This child who is to be born is of the Davidic line. We actually see in two different genealogies, in Matthew and Luke, one through the genealogy of Mary and one through the genealogy of Joseph, of, Joseph, of how, Dave, or how Jesus is of the line of David. From this couple, conceived of the Holy Spirit, would be the child who would come and save the entire world. There's joy surrounding this announcement, though. Mary, for a time, went to visit her aunt Elizabeth, who also had amazing news. She was barren. She couldn't conceive a child, but yet an angel came and visited Elizabeth's husband, told him, you'll have a child too, and his name will be John, and he prepared the way for the Messiah. The scriptures, it tells us how when Mary went to visit Elizabeth, the child inside of, inside of Elizabeth jumped for joy in the womb. That child, John, in his spirit knew that what is, the child growing in Mary was a savior of the world. The scriptures tell us too that the Romans had made a decree that everyone wants to go to their hometown and to come to do a census of all the people so the whole Roman Empire would know how many people were part of their empire. Joseph's hometown was Bethlehem. And that day, they didn't really care the situation of the family. They expected you to go. And so Mary, who was close to giving, close to the end of, time, of her term, still had to take this journey from their home in Nazareth all the way down to Bethlehem. 
was evening and they, re- they made it to Bethlehem. But scriptures tell us there's no room in any inn. It's a busy, bustling town because of everyone coming to their home to be registered for that decree. They went from inn to inn, knocking on doors, but no room for them at all until one innkeeper says, I have no room, but I have a manger you can use for now, a stable bed. What an odd place. A stable bed. Yet that's where, Je- where Mary gave birth to Jesus. The scriptures tell us of how Jesus would be born in a manger. He'd be wrapped in swaddling clothes. Around that time, after Jesus was born, an angel came before some shepherds. A bright light shone around the angel. And the, sh- the shepherds were afraid. The angel tells them, do not be afraid, for I bring you tidings of great joy. That today in the city of David, in Bethlehem, was born the Savior of the world, the Messiah. And a whole crowd of of angels came and started to proclaim glory to God in the highest. And peace on men on whom his favor rests. After the angels disappeared, they scurried off quickly. I don't know what they did with the sheep, but they all went quickly to the town of Bethlehem and found the manger where the Savior of the world lay. They were honored and surprised. Such lowly men, probably some of the lowest men of their culture, that God would bless to give this announcement From there, they went out from the manger and declared to the whole town, sharing of the good news that the Messiah had been born. Messiah Jesus had been born. The child who was born to be a king. Not just any king, the king of all kings. From the Lion of David to sit on the throne for eternity to be our King, to be our Savior and our Lord. So we said earlier, though, this isn't the end of the story. It's the beginning of the story. Because Jesus came for an important reason, to come and die for our sins on the cross. Can you think of any other king in history who was willing to lay down his life for his people? I can't think of one. Other than Jesus who came to be king and paid the ultimate price for each one of us. The point of the Christmas story is that Jesus came to die for us. I want to give us three challenges this morning based on what we've heard from Jeremiah, but also remembering the Christmas story. The first is this. Recognize that Jesus is the King of kings who loves you. He was willing to come and die on the cross for each one of us. Even those who weren't willing to accept him as Lord and Savior, he died for them still. Even though they don't have an eternity because they won't turn to him. But he chose to die for every one of us. Second point of action is confess your sins to him and make him Lord of your life. Because he was the only one who's deserving to be Lord of your life. And he's the only one who can take your sins away. Third point of action is remember why Jesus was born and give thanks to him. When you open up that Christmas gift on whenever it's be Christmas Eve or Christmas morning, whenever you celebrate that, that tradition of opening your gifts, as you open each gift, remember the greatest gift of all, the gift of Jesus coming in the form of a babe, coming to die for each one of us. There's a warning for us this morning. If we don't heed these words, there's a danger for us, and a danger of facing eternity in hell. So I implore you, if you haven't received Christ as your Lord and Savior, heed these words. Because if you do, and you turn to him and ask for forgiveness for your sins, he will forgive you. 
The words we mentioned earlier in our service, if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the blessing. If you heed these words, you'll be saved of your sins. And you'll receive the greatest gift of all, the gift of salvation. We remember the manger, but it also reminds us to remember the cross. Jesus began in a lowly place, the manger, died in a lowly place, the cross. But he was risen up to glory so that we can receive forgiveness of our sins. May we remember this, this Christmas season, the greatest gift of all, the gift of salvation, because Jesus loves us. Also think of it this way. The gift you're opening from underneath the Christmas tree this year is given to you from someone who loves you. What even a greater gift is that of salvation because Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit love you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your love and your grace. We thank you so much for this Christmas season that we have to celebrate your birth but also to remember the greatest gift you have ever offered, your gift of salvation. So Lord Jesus, as we have this time of Christmas, may we worship you and bring honor and glory to you. As we have time with family and friends, as we open our gifts, as we have meals together, may we remember your greatest gift of all. And Lord God, we give you praise and glory because of it. What a wonderful God you are. For these things we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.